Stay tuned for the Joan Quinn Profiles. Joan served the state of California as a member on the Arts Council and on the Film Commission. She was formerly on the Architectural Commission and fulfilled two terms on the Fine Arts Commission for the city of Beverly Hills. As an editor for Andy Warhol's Interview Magazine, Condé Nast Publications, and the Hearst Corporation, Joan covered the world of fashion, the mysteries of food, the excitement of theater, and the international art scene. She continues to find people who are on the cutting edge of their professions. Here's Joan Agajanian Quinn. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and welcome to the Joan Quinn Profiles. We're taping here at the Hollywood Museum in the historic Max Factor building on Highland Avenue and Hollywood Boulevard. And our guests are actress Deborah Christofferson and photographer Andy Romanoff. Actress Deborah Christofferson was born and raised in South Dakota, graduated from the University of South Dakota on a music scholarship, and she double majored in music and theater. She's been on the stage in Fiddler on the Roof, Man from La Mancha, all the ones that I love, Guys and Dolls, <laughs> among a lot of, of other ones. She's on TV in Murder One, NYPD, uh, Blue, CSI, and on and on, and the big screen, White Oleander, which was a great movie, and um, Stealing Time. But the last film she made was 1915, the movie. So you studied music. I did. Were you going to be a, a musical actress, or were you going to be on stage singing? What were you going to do? Well, that was the plan. I wanted to, uh, to do musical comedy on, on Broadway. That was always my dream. I haven't, haven't achieved it yet, but I haven't given up. No, don't <laughs> give up now, because I just saw Cheetah Rivera, and she, had this, she was fantastic in the play. Wow. And it was really interesting the way they wrote it for her, because all of our legs and muscles don't work <laughs> like they used to work, dancers' bodies, you know. She came out with a cane, and she, she referred to this part of her body was gone, this part was something else. So it was called The Visit. Uh -huh. and, um, but when she comes out for her, her uh, curtain call, she comes out really beautifully and she runs out and she bows. So Aww. it's great. Um, and she's a terrific singer and her voice is great, so don't give up. <laughs> That's I have no intention. Okay, okay, okay. So you were also acting then. Yes. And, and why did you go to Minneapolis? Instead of coming to L.A. or New York? Well, I wanted to get some professional credits under my belt. Because right out of college, um, I just felt like I needed some more life experience. And I wanted to know what it was really like out there, out there in the big, big world. In the big city, Minneapolis? Exactly. <laughs> well, compared to where I grew up. And in Vermilion's is a small town, too, the college. But, um, what was it? What was it? Not... Vermilion, in oh. University of South Dakota, in a, in a very small town in eastern South Dakota. And was that your hometown? Was no, that... my hometown is Spearfish. The only other place I know is Minot. Minot, that's North Dakota. Oh, that's well, North Dakota. You've heard of Deadwood. Yes. Certainly. Well, Spearfish is 10 miles north of Deadwood. <laughs> and it was very important in the early West, or in the, the, yeah. the, um, in the gold rush. Um, it was oh, part they of, all left? Well, yeah, they, <laughs> they all left. They should have left. Um, but Spearfish was um, an important town in, in, during that time period. Oh. and uh, part of the stagecoach route and everything. And, I love um, it. I, it's so great. It was called Spearfish because the Indians speared fish in the creek. Of course. They were those, very creative with those names, Deadwood, Spearfish. I know. Those <laughs> names are great, really. They really are. So you were acting and doing music. Yes. yes. When, when you actually started getting jobs, did each one help the other one? Like the acting part helped the music part? or? No. Uh, yes, yes, I think as any skill that you have ultimately reflects in other parts of your life, certainly. Uh, the thing that I noticed most about music affecting my acting is in the rhythm in which I speak. I've done voiceovers and I've done uh, for cartoons and, and when I go in to dub something and I always get complimented on my ability to just get it right away because of the rhythm of it. You mean to pick up the rhythm? Yeah, to I pick up the rhythm, whether it's my speaking, which I, you know, that's easier because it's my rhythm. Right. Or, for example, I did the English version of an Academy Award uh, film, Colia, which was a, a foreign film. 
and um, I picked up the rhythm very easily, and that I, I attribute to my musical background. Oh, that's very interesting, because the, today the poet laureate of L.A. was talking about poetry and how you get into the rhythm of it more so than what's going on mm -hmm. when you pro appreciate the rhythm. Yeah, it, it well, works it's musical. For you. It's a beat. Yeah, it's you know, whether you, it's a spoken word or a singing word. It, there's always a rhythm to it. There's a rhythm to speaking. When you learn accents for for oh. different roles, you learn the rhythm of it, the musicality of it. Um, for example, um, Irish ha is very musical, and it, it's da 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 da. You know, they, so you they're all that? over the place. And I hear the rhythm, and I hear the musicality of a language. You did 1915 was an Armenian language. Yes, actually, but did you have to do any rhythm on that? Uh, no, I didn't do any accent in that. No, you I didn't. Was, uh, no, we were. I was playing an American actress who comes out of retirement to participate in this one evening of theater. And so um, I was not. You didn't I, have to I do that. I didn't have to do any kind of no, an accent. No. We're going to get to that. But before that, we've got to get to LA from Minneapolis. Yes. Did you get something under your belt there? Were you acting there? And what brought you to LA? And why not New York again? Well, I had planned, uh, <laughs> when I went to college, I had planned to go to New York to do mm -hmm. theater. Right. And then I saw Star Wars. And I'm a geek. <laughs> what can I say? I'm a sci fi geek. Um, I saw Star Wars, and it literally changed my life. It was so much fun, and it, it honestly gave me a new perspective on God because it's like the wholeness and the force and the totality, and, you know, we're all one. And um, it just, it was so much fun, and I thought, that's what I want to do. I want to I have that kind of fun, and I want to touch people on a, on a larger scale For and, film? and to touch their lives the way but it touched mine. Because of film rather than being on Broadway or on the stage? Yes. I see. The, the, I so see. it was so like that the film was your... aspect of it and, and, and just... I mean, it literally changed my life, and I thought how incredible to be a part of something um, that can affect people that way. And so after I spent two years in Minneapolis doing play after play after play, sometimes simultaneously. Which um, is great. Which was wonderful. God bless being 20 years old. You know? I know. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, uh, and then I decided, it was like, okay, do, do I go to New York then or do I go to L.A.? And it was so cold for two years uh, in Minneapolis. Uh, it was like, okay, right. I'm, I'm going south. I got so it. So there were a few factors, but, but mostly it was I decided I really wanted to, do, to try my hand at the film industry. And did you go on stage right away? Did you in, go on stage when you got to L.A.? No, I didn't. No, I came out here and um, uh, I did um, several workshops to learn how to, 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 oh. to do film and TV because when you learn Stage from a theater work, uh, point right. of view, in uh -huh. fact, there's an anecdote that I would share. Um, the first film I did was a student film at UCLA. Uh, there was a paper called Dramalog, and it used to list all these I opportunities. That, yes, right. and um, I didn't have an agent when I first got here. I wondered. <laughs> so it's like, okay, how can I get my foot in the door? So I did a student film, so I would get tape on myself, and it was a musical. It was called All Around American Girl. And I had a scene, we were in an exercise class, and I had to run up to the big mirror and sing into the mirror. And so they said, action, and I ran up to the mirror, and I started playing to the crowd, <laughs> as in theater, you know? <laughs> now, cut, 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 no, 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 play to the camera, sing to the camera. Oh. And I went up, you know, action, oh, and no. I did it again. <laughs> I'm like, okay, Deborah, you're not on stage, just sing to the camera. And the next time I did, I, I that's do That's interesting, isn't it? Yes, that That's yes. what takes over? But that's what, it was just my automatic instincts to right. play. I'm singing, you're, I'm playing to the, to the audience. And you're training. And thank God I wasn't spending hundreds of thousands of dollars with each take. <laughs> um, but it was, it was invaluable experience because it's, completely, it's a completely different skill to act in front of a camera than it is to act on stage. Well, that's stage. what I wondered, because, but you've been on stage so much, and you've been on camera so much, so obviously you've perfected doing that. <laughs> and talking about the, the small, you got an award, you were in an Oscar award winning small short film? I wa well, it wasn't award winning, but it was Oscar nominated. It was nominated. Oscar nominated. Um, there were over 5,000 um, entries, and we were one of five that got the nomination. Isn't so that great? It was phenomenal. It was, it's a small, it's a, it's a little 12 minute film called Seraglio, which is Italian for harem or cage for wild beasts. Ah. And it's about a woman who is unfulfilled in her life and she finds a way to creatively fulfill, become fulfilled. So are you on the whole 12 minutes? Yes, I'm the star of the film. You're the star. Yeah. Well, you're not the star of 1915 because the star is Simone Abkarian, I would say, wouldn't you? Absolutely. And 
how was it working with him? He's oh, a phenomenal actor. He's a phenomenal actor. He is. We had a moment. Um, unfortunately, it didn't end up on screen, but but I will never forget it. And it's he is playing a character who has to say goodbye to his family, and I'm playing his mother. <laughs> I know. I thought Acting. that was so. <laughs> but you, go on. I'll let you finish. And. and um, <laughs> And we had this moment where we say goodbye, and, and it just, it was so real and so powerful, and it just left me weak in the knees. It's a good thing I was sitting down, because I think I would have just fallen. I mean, it was just, just so powerful, and it was so real. And, and it's one of the best moments, acting moments I've ever had. Um, and with Simone, it was just, we were so in the moment, and we were so connected to the material. And it was just beautiful. Was it like that all? It was a 20-day shoot at mm -hmm. the Los Angeles, uh, Los Angeles Theater. Yes. And the co-producer, the two co-directors and writers, um, Garen Hovanesian mm -hmm. and Alec Bohebian. Yes. Um, were on stage with you, or directing you, I guess. Yes. And was everybody like that all the time? Was it always so t tense? Oh, no, not at all. Oh, it no, wasn't. And that, and that scene, the tension was in the scene, but not in the performance. The performance was uh -huh. was just this flowing of energy between Simone and I. The, um, it, it was amazing. <laughs> I, I, it, but, but the tension, but tension, there was tension in the moments. Um, I meant in tension the moments. in the moments. Yes, yeah, tension in I the meant. moments, definitely, yes. And was it there a lot? Did you feel it in a lot of those scenes? Because it's, tell the story. Of 1915. Of 1915. The movie is, um, it's about a play that is being produced for one evening on the 100th anniversary of the Ar Armenian Genocide. And that's why it's called 1915. And this play has, was written by um, the character that Simon is playing. And um, he had been absent from the stage for seven years. He and his partner, acting partner, wife, had been absent from the stage for seven years. And it's a mystery within the movie that you find out why. Um, and we watched the performers who each have their own issues going on. Each of them is sort of in a state of denial. And we watched them come together and rehearse the play that day and then perform it that evening. And it's, so it's, it's the psychological drama of watching this happen throughout the course of a day. So it's like the background, what's going on in the background, yes. and it's what's going on on the stage and how he's directing it. Right. And he stands alone so much, doesn't he? He's, he sat in this chair not long ago I when, we him. when we interviewed him. So you're in his chair. <laughs> uh, but I was, I was having breakfast with Maggie Goshen from the Eskegen Museum, who loaned a lot of the props. Really? Yes, yeah, she loaned that shirt thing that you wear, mm -hmm. the gown that you wear, and then they added something to it. And she said, Deborah Christofferson, she was perfect in the oh, role. Oh, that's lovely. She was just all over you. She thought you were great. So oh. I wanted you to know that. Well, thank you so and much. And she was very much a part of it because she brought things from the Armenian Museum there and brought them to the set. I knew that we had some wonderful pieces, absolutely wonderful. Um, there was a shawl also that I wore that was from the museum. That was just, it was an honor to, Wasn't it? to be able to work with those things. And, and the people involved in it um, mostly were Armenian. Yes. I know. I so was, that was like... I was amazed. I didn't think I had a chance in, in the world to get this role because I'm Scandinavian. <laughs> I know. You don't look like us yes. at all. I know. And I, t I told Garina and, and Alec, I'm like, are you kidding me? And they're like, oh, no, no. We know, we know Armenians who look just like you, Debbie. You're fine. Oh, and, uh, by the time I got the makeup on and the, the costume and everything, um, you know, it was a transformation and, and I, I loved it. And I'm so glad you came to talk to us today. Oh, thank you for inviting me. It was my pleasure. And don't go away, we'll be right back with photographer Andy Romanoff. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and welcome back to the Joan Quinn Profiles. You know we're taping at the Hollywood Museum on Highland, and I have photographer Andy Romanoff, who was born and raised in Chicago, is a self-taught photographer, along with his day job of being a cinematographer and a specialist camera operator, which I have to find out what that <laughs> means. He belongs to the prestigious American Society of Cinematographers, and he contributed to uh, the photo magazine, Loy. I regularly. Are you still? Regularly. Okay. So 
you were kicked out of five schools. You're such a quiet little soul. What did you do to get kicked out of five schools? I wasn't so quiet. Oh, you were No. <laughs> what I happened? Was, I was angry. I was distressed, and I hated it. I hated every bit of it. I was not good at school. I was good. I mean, I was smart and all the rest of it. I hated it. Isn't that something you, you just are like... To me, you seem so easygoing, and then for me to read your bio that I was kicked out of five schools, is like, what did this guy do? And this is the sugar-coated version. This is the right now? <laughs> we have a nice guy. No, huh? no, no. no. I'm, I'm saying the, the bio oh. is the sugar-coated version. You mean it version. was even worse? Oh, yeah. Oh, please. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so what brought you to L.A. from Chicago? Oh, was it Chicago schools where you were kicked out? Oh, yes. Oh, good. Yes. Okay. Oh, yes. Let's no, blame never it on would have Chicago. Happened. Never no, would have never happened would have in happened. L.A. Right. I, I, you know, to make movies. To make movies. I had started as a still photographer in Chicago. Within a year or two, I knew that I wanted to make movies. I, I did. I worked on some just wretched, atrocious movies in Chicago. I worked on the beginning of gore films. Um, how did you get those? How did you get those was, jobs? Because it was one guy in Chicago who made films. I was there were two say, guys actually. Yeah. Herschel Lewis and Dave Friedman were these guys, and they invented the Gore film. And I was an 18-year-old kid, and and I was told, call this guy, and he makes movies, and maybe he'll give you a job on a movie. So they let me be a, a PA for 50 bucks a week, and I learned. That's how you learned. I was going to say, yeah. how do you become a cinematographer, and what is a cinematographer? Well. Um, so a cinematographer is a, is a photographer who is responsible for all the photography of a movie or a TV show or, you know, or something or, you know, or, or a documentary or whatever. Um, and, and the job is generally larger than the work of a photographer because you have to, you have to, you know, manage a large crew and you have to, oh. you're, you're creating, you know, at the beginning, I'm going to be doing 800 shots over the next eight weeks. Uh -huh. and. Each one has to match and has to find a place in the rhythm of the story and, and, and so then on. And then who, who, you have a lot of people working for you? It's not just this, just you doing the camera work? No, it's not at all. <laughs> that's, <laughs> I, no. Well, that's why I'm asking you, because it's pretty interesting. John, this is Hollywood. <laughs> <laughs> what do you Those do? Those studios just filled with people. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you say, I'm ASC, you take I, the camera? I'm, I am not an ASC cinematographer. I'm an ASC associate, and that's really oh, important. So it's yeah. different? I, it's absolutely different. Um, I am a cinematographer. I, I shot, you know, a lot of little low-budget movies, uh, and I started the film department for WTTW in Chicago and shot early oh, PBL were. before PBS oh, wow. documentaries, and I, I mean I did a lot of stuff. But but by the time I became kind of known to the ASC community, I was no longer shooting. Is that right? Yeah. So that was yeah. nice that you're an associate. Oh, it's it's wonderful. And when I'm you associate. were shooting, did you take apprentices too? To oh, work sure. for you, just like because you worked I, as an apprentice. John, I had no choice. We oh. would go. We would go. <laughs> <laughs> we would go to North Carolina to make a movie like Moonshine Mountain, and we would bring three experienced people or five experienced people and hire locals. Oh, I see. Guys who had never worked in their life on a movie, oh. and you know, be trying to teach them. Okay, now hold this piece of cardboard up. Here. Oh, <laughs> to I block it. the light. I see, I see, I see. Yeah. So that's part of it. What is a specialist cameraman? Uh, in 1976, um, I, I was lucky enough to see the very first remote controlled camera crane in existence, oh. a thing called the Luma crane. Oh. I was in France. I saw this thing. I somehow convinced these guys, you know, I, it's a long, long story. It's not for this show. But the bottom line is, I was involved in bringing remote camera technology into the motion picture business. And in order wow. to do that, the huge difference between what we had always done before then, which was to ride on the crane. You know those great yes. movies where yeah. the camera rises up and there's three guys and it's always guys, there's never any women on no, it. No, it's always a Hollywood <laughs> production that exactly. looks like that, right? <laughs> and for the first time, that was, that was all that went away and all that was out at the end of the crane was the oh. camera and nobody knew how to do it and everybody was afraid of it because instead of looking through the eyepiece and feeling the motion with your body you sat there at a TV screen and the camera started moving. You say, oh my god where's it going 
and I became... Oh, and then, then you guided it I, from down would, below yeah, and, and watching I, a screen? I trained all the early, early oh, users, wow. and I was one of the people who was comfortable doing it, so I did a bunch of the early work. Well, I'm glad I yes. asked about yeah. that, because yeah. the other thing I was going to ask about is all the time you've been doing this, you were doing your own photography. Yes. With... I guess a camera like I use, or when did you pick up a camera what, like we use? I, <laughs> like, you know, like a normal all, person uses. Were you cameras, five years old or what? Uh, no, I was uh, 14 or 15. Oh, you were. Yeah. And what did you but, do? Why did you get camera, a camera? The first camera I ever picked up was a box camera. You, yeah, know, you look down like this and you snap the little thing. And, and you heard it click. <laughs> yes, and you heard it click, exactly. And then you roll. You, <laughs> and you yeah. heard it right. That yeah. was a film you were rolling yeah. in the box. Yeah. Well, that's what I wondered. Is that what you started with? That's absolutely what I started with. And, and how did you teach yourself? Did you develop film? Did you? Uh, I, I, I did. Did you? <laughs> I did for a wedding photographer, you know. I, I, oh, that's yeah. great. And the first place I ever worked was for a, a classic old portrait photographer, a guy who had a giant studio camera. Uh. Um, but, but I was totally an apprentice at the bottom of the scale. And at the same time, I was going out and making pictures. Oh, you were still, yeah. yeah. Oh, so you really yeah. did start at the as an apprentice with your own camera on the side rather yeah. than being a cinematographer. Yeah. But I learned very little from those guys. I oh, should have. Really? I... So, so while you were working, here you are, you uh, have a project at the Pacific Design Center. Right. And why would some, what would you do there? What okay. would you photograph there? Okay. I, about three or four years ago, I started uh, to seriously pursue you know, what people call fine art photography. Fine art, right. Um, and, and I started to get some shows, and I started to get shows at Pacific Design Center, oh, among other places. Yes, because they had and art was, galleries there. There's a bunch had, of galleries, yeah. Right. And, I, and I was fascinated. I walked into the place. I'd never been in it in my life. And it was remarkable. It was, it was baffling and incomprehensible. And, and I realized it was enormous, and I didn't know anything about it, and I was not alone that millions of people drove by it um. and knew the the exterior shape, but they knew nothing about what happened there. The blue whale. The blue We're whale. We're talking about the blue whale. Okay. Yeah. So I made a proposal. I conceived oh. an idea and I made a proposal to uh, Charles Cohen's, uh, has his own curator and she's responsible for the program there. And, and so, he owns the company now. And because he, owns, he, he owns the Pacific just, Design Center. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and said, I have an idea. I'd like to come. I'd like you to give me a space in the design center. And let me have free reign to go anywhere in the building, the basements, the rooftops, anywhere. Oh. I don't want to spend a year. He negotiated me down to six months. But, but, but that, was, that was great, actually, <laughs> the, to photograph for six months. And so, and it was perfect, and it was wonderful, because I had to work on the same thing every single day. Were you and there all the time? All the time. I made myself go, even when I was bored, even when I... And how many photographs did you take? Two or three oh, hundred? Oh, thousands. Oh, thousands. Yeah, no, no. I made thousands of photographs. And then you showed... Eventually showed about 300 uh, on monitors and 70 on the wall. Oh, how great. Yeah. But then, talking about that led me to the project at the First Church, First right. Congregational Church on right. 6th and Westmoreland. Mm -hmm. Beautiful, gothic church, gorgeous windows inside, a choice, beautiful chapel that uh, Reverend Scott Colglazer wanted to do something with. It hadn't been used really well, this mm -hmm. space. And our friend Dan McCleary, who is a wonderful artist and lives in that area, worked, right. uh, has, has a group of Children, I call them, but they're almost adults, they're aren't not, they? They're not kids. No. They're not kids, but they're wonderful artists that he's been training. Mm -hmm. And um, I thought Dan would be fabulous. So Dan and I met with the Reverend Cole Glazer in the chapel. Right. And here comes Andy. <laughs> <laughs> so tell us the rest of the story. <laughs> Dan didn't feel that his group was ready at that moment. Scott had something he wanted to do. I didn't know Scott. I had never been in the church. Dan said to me, we were at lunch five, six months ago. He said, Andy, how's the work coming? I said, I, I had this new project. I had uh -huh. this 15,000 Buddhist project. Oh, you were doing the 15,000 Buddhists oh, at yes. the time. Oh, that's what led into oh, it. Oh, yes. I I'd see. been working on that for about a year. I see. And Danny said, how are you doing with it? And I said, I'm really it's going good. I'm really happy with it. He said, well, you ought to be showing it. 
And I said, Dan, I don't want to be shown right now. I just want to focus on the work. And he said, no, no, you're an artist. You show once a year. I said, okay, I'll think about it. He's so great. And the next thing I knew, he called me up. He said, bring your stuff. I'm taking you to meet somebody. Walked me in the door. He said, show this stuff to, the, to, and you know, know, to Scott. And, you know, we wanted to, to embrace Dan because he was right in our community, in our area. Right. But when he came with your pieces... And how many pieces did you put up in the chapel? They are absolutely perfect. They couldn't have been better. Thank and I'm you. thrilled because I was working on that project. Thank you. So this... 31. 31, 31, large, in this, 31 large prints. And this is one of them we're going to talk about. This is one of them. And, and, and it's a whole division of different kinds of religions and spiritual beings, right? It is. I, the, the project, the name of the project, the over big project, is 15,000 Buddhas. And 15,000 Buddhas is taken from the title of a Korean painting called 15,000 Buddhas, which is actually a single Buddha. Oh. And with the words 15,000 Buddha over, I but see. when you come very close to it, 15,000 hand-drawn little Buddhas this oh, big. It's right. a 1,000 year old painting. Right. And it, it was kind of the catchstone. It was the place where I decided what I wanted to do was to make thousands of images of religious icons. I see. And what a great influence. That, yeah, yeah. What a great influence you picked up. And so you, did you, this is one of the pieces that was in? This is, this is. This is one that Scott used to talk about um, when he gave resurrection. His... Oh, really? This is what he used as what is the image this? he talked about on Easter. This is difficult for me, this one. This one is absolutely beautiful. Thank you. And where did you take all these 15,000? <laughs> you haven't done them all yet. I, no, no, no. I've done, at this point, I've made about 1,500. Oh. I'm a tenth of a way good. there. That's yeah. good. And where, where was this taken? <laughs> that one is uh, outside of New York City at a Franciscan monastery. Oh. Uh, this one is, is at Let the, me show a, to the camera. Uh, a, a Chinese uh, monastery, uh, again in New York. And when did you start doing this? Now, about 18 months ago. Oh, that's all? And yeah. you've been all over the I've, country? I've been Eastern Europe, Western Europe, uh, and, and a significant number of places in America. And working on this project? All the time. Fabulous. And this yeah. piece? This is from the Rubin Museum in New York City. Oh, the Rubin Museum. They have a huge collection, Stunning don't they? Stunning museum. Wonderful museum. Oh, that's so great. Yeah. I'm going to hold these here because I think it's okay. easier. This one's going to be hard for the camera to see, but... This is the Christ that uh, Pope, Pope John used to meditate in front of when this was in his church in, uh, in Krakow. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. I knew I loved this it so is, much. It's so beautiful. And were you there to, you were there to photograph I was, it? I was there. This is the most difficult picture I've ever, I mean, emotionally difficult picture I've ever made. I stayed awake all night after I made this picture wondering about pain and wondering about humanity. Pain and, and moving. It was moving. Yeah. Oh, yes, absolutely. And this one is so beautiful and so old. And this one is key <laughs> to understanding what I'm doing. Oh, because, good. Because this one is, is uh, at the Metropolitan Museum in New York, and you've seen it, oh, right. and everybody has seen it, and you walk by it, but it is now an object of history and not what it was when it was made, which was the portrait of a young living person and a god. And oh. what I'm trying to do with all of these pictures is to, is to reconnect these images, which we kind of, they're just, you know, they're wood, they're, they're right. in the corner or whatever. Was this a sarcophagus? No, I, I, don't, I don't believe this is a sarcophagus. But, but is but it stone? It's, oh yes, it's, it's stone. a stone. Yeah, yeah. And connecting all this together is, is your goal? <sighs> I, look, my goal is to make a huge number of works in a kaleidoscopic representation of, of the sacred, the way every single group in humanity has created something in the sacred. Not everybody uses faces. I mean, we know there are no, plenty of religions that, so that don't. This is great. And you've brought these faces to light the same way he did with lots of power. Thank you. Thank you, Andy. Oh. <laughs> and thanks for watching. Keep writing to J-A-Q-U-I-N-N-1 at AOL.com.